Here is my knowledge lecture on the meaning of the titles of five degree regal Rosicrucians. The first title is regional. This refers to the rank and file that the Rosicrucians are those representing a region within a larger hierarchy. The titles for such a position are plural in the extreme, and none others need be mentioned here. Think of the regions on a map of the Earth. Now think of these moving as the Earth rotates around its axis, exchanging day for night relative to which side of the Earth is facing the Sun. Now think of these moving as the Earth revolves around the Sun, and observe how this divides the days and nights into the different degrees of the four seasons. Now see that the different regions of Earth develop warm climates over time due to the length of the days they face the sun in warm seasons, when Earth and the sun are near. Now see that the different regions of Earth become cold from facing away from the sun for longer durations. But look, there is more. See how, just as these regions of Earth are subject to hot and cold climates for different periods over the ages, so too do the magnetic poles of Earth occasionally reverse the direction of their charge. This is because none of these periods is exactly equal. None of the orbits are regular, all are oblate or elliptical, obliquely angled to one another, None of the rotations are perfectly circumferential of a single polar region because the axis wobbles, which also causes the electromagnetic poles to reverse at certain times, which happens when the geographic and electromagnetic poles coincide and overlap. All of this happens with aperiodicity in location, duration, etc meaning that the planet Earth is never in the same exact location when the periods of ages, seasons of climates, and features of regions are all one way as it was the last time they were, and it never twice has the exact same climate and regions for the same amount of time. However, the regions the Rosicrucians really govern over are perfectly periodic. There will, they calculate, come a time when all of these events overlap and occur together, when there is the first noticeable change in the climates we humans have celebrated holidays. We therefore venerate the transitional periods between climatological plateaus. These themselves calculate the Rosicrucians, gradually pass through dual phases, like night and day. One of these phases, night for day, is when all the orbits, rotations, and poles are wobbling, alternating, and aperiodic. The other, day for night, is when all the orbits, rotations, and poles are straight and equal and even. At least, so calculate the Rosicrucians. This is the meaning of the true rose, for just as the false or fallen rose signifies to the common mind the cross, so too does the cross in the mind of the enlightened conjure up the idea of a rose. This means that, as we have raised up the minds of men since the early Renaissance, the five-petaled rose has been associated in the mind with the thorns of that vine. Just as the crown of thorns was placed upon the head of Christ to mark, that is, to stain or taint the majesty of his blood, red as a rose, so, too, when a true Rosicrucian sees a rose by any other name, he will only see a remarkable pattern, and this pattern is exemplified by the grand cross of the planets in the zodiac. 
The Grand Cross occurs when any number of the terrestrial planets align with any number of the Jovian planets at the same time as they both align with Earth. There are any number of incredibly complex geometric variations on these parameters, of course. However, all we need to know in order to be able to make calculations, that is, predictions, about future climate changes in our various regions is what exact alignment and of how many planets we are closest to, which, that is, has happened most recently, or is about to happen next. For example, a grand cross alignment of Earth with the seven planets known to the ancient alchemists as metals occurred on May the 5th, Gregorian calendar year 2000. Because the event itself occurred on a specific date, that is within the year 2000, on an anciently reckoned calendar, tends to indicate that such events occur cyclically. Thus, there is some form of harmony that was perceived by those calculating our current calendar with the Grand Cross alignment and possibly among many, many others. However, let us pause for only this moment to consider the Grand Cross alignment of 5-5-2000 of the seven alchemical planets. This is the Rosy Cross. The rose of seven petals, that is, the true rose, is the planets in the alignment of their orbits and the true cross is the alignment of their orbits itself. However, the true rose cross is even more than this, infinitely more. For consider the strange twisting into three dimensions of the Pythagorean arrangement of seven, or for that matter, five, number squares, and you will behold how the cross becomes the rose over time. Now it is obvious that the Pythagorean arrangement of magic number squares will fold up regardless of whether it includes seven, five, or any number of squares. The use of seven in specific, and related by alchemists to the metals, and by astrologers to planets, refers directly to the Grand Cross of seven planets that occurred on May 5th, 2000. So we say that this seven-planet Grand Cross must have occurred before, and it must have occurred a duration previous and a duration hence from now that, while not equal, are harmonious, and while not precisely periodic, are calculable. In this way, learn that the seven planets associated by the ancient alchemists with metals does not mean these seven were the only planets known to ancient astronomers, any more than these seven were the only metals known to ancient metallurgists. These were, however, chosen by the cult of alchemists among the metallurgists and by the cult of astrologers among the astronomers as being significant of something else, that is, referring to something greater. The greater thing that these seven refer to is the alignment of the same seven heavenly spheres on May 5th, 2000 AD. The alchemists and the astrologers recognize the significance of periodicity in time. The astrologers sought to predict events based on the positions of the planets in the heavens. The alchemists sought to find a way of ingesting superconductive metal that would result in immortality. These both reflect that the alchemists and the astrologers contemplated time as it was made manifest in the combinations of patterns that comprise natural phenomena. In other words, their studies as metallurgists and astronomers had led them to discover the inherent periodicity that underlies the seeming aperiodicity of cyclical events. In still other words, they rediscovered for us all, by each discovering for themselves, that by comparing objects in nature one can see the repetition of events over time, 
in the simplest words possible. If you want to make a model of the planetary alignments, all you need to use are different colored stones. The second title is Blue. This is the meaning of the blue rose. The rose is red because it is reflecting electrons of the wavelength our intraocular cones register as red. The red shift of the galaxies is a similar effect, and it is how we know that space-time is expanding as all the visible galaxies in the universe appear to be moving away from us and one another, thus portraying a red shift to their spectral emissions as the wavelengths are elongated due to the Doppler effect on rays of photon radiation. Basically, red photon radiation has longer wavelengths than, say, blue photon radiation. Now, in the same way that different stars appear different colors as they age through and around the main sequence, because of the content of their gas vacuumed in and ignited by the star's initial nova, so too do galaxies appear red-shifted, not because space-time in between galaxies is increasing. It is that the space-time interior to the galaxies is decreasing. All formed galaxies have black holes in them. Spiral galaxies have one at the center. These black holes are vacuuming in space-time within the galaxies towards their center. However, the depth of a black hole is thought to be capable of tunneling to nearly the beginning of space-time, when the forces split following the Big Bang. Therefore, when we look through our telescopes into the deep field of the filaments, walls, and voids of our local universe, galaxies appear red-shifted, because the galaxies are being consumed into themselves. This causes the optical illusion of the space between them increasing. So it is, too, with the rose. It absorbs every color of the spectral wavelengths of photon light, however red it reflects. This means that the rose is literally the opposite color of the light that is bouncing off it. It is, in essence, every color other than the one it appears to be. However, to depict a rose of every color other than red by mixing pigments is impossible. Therefore, we say, in essence, because we mean electromagnetically, and by electromagnetically, we mean by making use of photon light. Therefore, to depict a rose of every color other than red, we use the shorthand of a blue rose, because blue is the exact inversion of red on the color spectrum. The reason for wanting to depict a blue rose is to see the false or fallen rose as it truly is. Why is blood red? It is because of the pigmentation hues of our platelet cells inside our plasma. However, were we to see this color as it truly is, it would be blue. This is the way it appears through our semi-translucent epidermis while it still flows inside the capillaries, veins, and arteries beneath. The vein beneath the skin looks blue. This is because no light is reaching the blood directly. Therefore, it is reflecting the opposite color wavelength of photon radiation than if it were exposed to light. It is like seeing a silhouette through paper. The paper is white, and the light is white, but the shadow is black. This is because the light can slightly permeate the paper, but it cannot pass through the object casting the shadow. This is why the paper is white with light, but the object behind it is dark. It is dark because it has mass. In the same way, blood inside the vein looks the opposite color as it does outside the vein. Some would say that the blood of anemics and other rarities of blood type comprise the blue blood de facto royal families of the super wealthy among the power elites. This, of course, is not true, for we see one generation thrust up by no greater factors than dumb luck 
only for their third or fifth or even seventh generation to lose this fortune to chance fate. We would not see otherwise random occurrences such as these were the randomly wealthy by blood descended exclusively from, say, ancient pharaohs of Egypt, ancient Roman emperors, etc. Those who subscribe to this form of pseudoscience trace the lineage of the blue bloods back to the Rh negative plasma that lacks the gene of the rhesus monkey. Rhesus monkeys are from Indonesia and have been found at one time or another across Oceania from Australia to New Zealand to the Indian subcontinent. Most of humanity, eugenicists claim, descended from rhesus monkeys. The blue bloods, however, they claim, are a rare strand of human that did not evolve from the rhesus monkey. However, when asked to back these very scientific-sounding claims up using further scientific evidence, the eugenicists cannot, and so resort to vague quotes from early Hebrew scripture. Instead, the scientific fact of the Rh-negative blue bloods is that they do possess the potential genetic combination recognized as the rhesus monkey gene. However, it is scrambled up in unused junk DNA and has not been activated by the RNA enzyme cellular replication process. Far from making these blue bloods anything as fanciful as interdimensional reptiles from Draco, scientific evidence indicates that it is likely due to the redistribution of populations over the generations itself causing the activation of certain adaptive and newly necessary to survival junk DNA molecules while deactivating others. Some populations, though dispersed to different parts of the world, continue perpetuating certain genetic combinations over the generations, while others propagate different combinations. Gradually, some genetic differences break down as these populations intermingle, while others strengthen. This is the joyous genetic dance called, so crudely, survival of the fittest. The third title is Isosahedron. The Isosahedron was associated with the force of air by the Greek philosophers. This is why Plato, author of the Socratic Dialogues, called the pre-Socratics sophists, because while they considered pure philosophy tautological solipsism on the element's ephemeral characteristics, Plato's avatar Socrates described these traits by attributing them to the five regular solids. This philosophy of idealizing the regular mathematical constructs in our dimension over the more ephemeral traits of natural forces in themselves is itself all too egocentric to be questioned, although, as always, great pride reveals a fatal flaw. If examined, the original attributes of the four terrestrial elements, plus spirit, representing the force of gravityless tachyonic light, have an esoteric attribution. According to more recent research, however, this arrangement is a carefully coded message. It is decoded by rearranging the attributions of forces and shapes by creating two columns, one of the five solids and one of the five elements, and then going down one line and up the other. For example, the force of air was associated by the Greek philosophers with the isosahedron. The force of air is listed as occurring third by the classical and traditional order of elements, evenly on the two-column list with the isosahedron, if written by the Greek correspondence values. However, if we turn one column upside down, then the isosahedron will be associated with fire, and the element of air will be associated with the dodecahedron, which itself had previously represented cosmos, or spirit, which is then exchanged for the tetrahedron, which to the Greeks represented fire, and so forth. And so, the Rosicrucian isosahedron is associated with the element of fire, however, and not with the Greek element of air. 
Also, just as the platonic solids were held as ideal above the elements and were yet misattributed, so too do the platonic solids rightly describe the terrestrial elemental traits, such as the dodecahedron representing the zodiac, the tetrahedron representing flame, cube, earth, etc. However, the platonic solids themselves are inferior to the universal elemental forces, the strong and weak nuclear, electromagnetic forces, and the force of gravity. Therefore, the platonic solid of the isosahedron here describes the higher fire and the lower air. However, we Rosicrucians invert these attributes for the isosahedron a second time, such that it represents terrestrial flame and universal air, that is, the electromagnetic force. We do this in order to remember that, to describe the higher element of fire, the universal weak nuclear force, we use the platonic solid the Greeks attributed to air, and that we use the same platonic solid to describe the higher element of air, the electromagnetic force, as we use to describe the lower element of the flame. Remember that both of fire and air each have three components. Fires are the fuel, the flame, and the smoke. The airs are clear, clouds, and storm. Fire's fuel is air, and so fire draws air in towards it. It creates a funnel of radiative heat upwards, defying Earth's gravity. Air's fuel is water, and air draws water in towards it. It creates a vacuum of carbonized smoke or ionized mist that condensates water vapor. All the terrestrial elements have three components. The higher elements are simply the four universal forces. The fourth title is electromagnetism. EM refers to the electromagnetic force, that is, the force that carries the visible color spectrum. Of course, we know there are more colors of radiative photon wavelengths than we can see. However, when we look directly at these phantom colors, they only appear to us as infrared and ultraviolet. This is another reason the distant galaxies look red-shifted, because the gaseous chemical components of all the stars are comprised of substances that do not reflect colors that appear in the visible color spectrum but only show up using radio wave, x-ray, or even gamma wave spectral analysis. These colors, like the chemical contents of the gases giving them off, appear in a quantitatively different set of characteristics for our physical environment than we have got words to describe or even eyes to see, let alone the imagination to catalog. In the same way that stellar gases can be super dense or airy, the colors they emanate are photon rays whose wavelengths are so long or so short or that move so fast or so slowly that we do not refer to them as photons anymore. We call the vibrations that occur on this level electromagnetic radiation, and we call photons electromagnetic radiation. However, to indicate that photons are only a part contained within the full electromagnetic spectrum. Below ultraviolet, or very slow-moving, long-wavelength photon radiation, lie the radio wave frequencies. Below the radio wave frequencies, which can carry pulsed sequences or encoded messages that can be amplified and made audible to the human ear, are X-rays that can penetrate soft tissue, but leave a shadow of bone matter on a certain kind of X-ray sensitive film. Below X-rays are gamma rays, and these occur in random bursts throughout the galaxy, as well as throughout intergalactic space. Using a certain type of spectroscopy telescope, we can record the distant emissions of these gamma ray bursts. However, we have not yet, to my knowledge at the time of this writing, 
recorded an actual gamma ray burst as it was occurring. This is because, as I said, they pop into and out of existence seemingly at random throughout our galaxy and throughout deep space, never appearing in the same place twice. All of this comprises the EM spectrum inferior to photon radiation, which is believed to be the fastest speed of radiation possible, given the limited self-correcting and auto-correlated laws of universal physics. However, in the same manner and fashion as we can imagine going faster than the fastest speed we are told is physically possible, so too does the actual EM spectrum encompass even wavelengths faster than photons and should be thought of as including even wavelengths slower than gamma rays, such as the quantum particles of the weak and strong nuclear forces. In fact, there is as much more beyond the known number of elemental forces that we see spirit begins, splits or halves, and ends the elemental tetragrammaton in the form of the three mothers, Aleph, supernal air, Mem, supernal water, and Shin, supernal fire, each duly replaced by one of the three fathers, Yod, Mercury, He, salt, and Vav, sulfur. We have comprehension of the possible existence of worlds lower than that of our perception, that vibrate as wavelengths so long and slow that we can only perceive them as the aeons of time, the ice ages, etc., and of worlds higher than that of our perception, that vibrate wavelengths so short and so fast that they seem to us to be going backward in time. All of this can be understood. The very long wavelengths are fractals of the very small wavelengths. The very small wavelengths are gnomons of the fractals. A gnomon is a living or self-replicating pattern. A fractal is a dead or self-terminating pattern. Gnomons appear as dark space in fractals. For example, the Mandelbrot set, as a gnomon, appears at very small resolution of the Julius set, a Fibonacci spiral. However, the Julius set does not appear as a dark space pattern smaller than or within the Mandelbrot set. This is the difference between a fractal and a gnomon. It is also the difference between something moving one direction, say, up for forward in time, and something moving the opposite direction, say, down for backwards in time. A very long, slow wavelength constitutes our forward time flow. Very fast microwaves comprise quantum moving opposite this direction in time. The forward flow we call uppercase G for massive gravity. The backward flow we call lowercase g for subatomic gravity. But the macrocosmic G is the same as the microcosmic G, and already this Hermes thrice blessed is nothing. It has been known to we Rosicrucians for quite some time all these things. We have known about all this for long enough to enshroud it in ten million meanings. But I tell you, as much as I have revealed here, so much more shall be revealed in the higher levels. This lesson teaches us not to forget that the term EM for the spectrum is as arbitrary as calling the sum of all matter energy only the nuclear forces or the gravitational force alone. It has these four features in each universe equal to or lesser than our own, however in each combination in different ratios, as each of our own universes baby universes that collectively comprise the multiverse encapsulating around our own universe, are formed from matter swallowed into the black holes at the centers of spiral galaxies. However, in any universe greater than our own, there would be more than four forces. This is because, just as time, as a single direction, is added to the three-dimensional directions of local space, 
so too is there a dimension for the inversion or the opposite direction of time. And so too is there a holographic motion of involution in every part and thus overall throughout the whole. Involution alternates interiorizing or contraction and exteriorizing or expansion. This is the Kabbalistic running and returning. The fifth title is Mars. Just as the heavenly body we now know as Mars was once known to the Greeks as Ares, the god of war, so too does this title not pertain to the planet or to the metal of Mars, so much as it does to the Olympic dignitary over the camia or the relevant sized number square. For example, in the Greek camia of the Olympic dignitaries, we see that for five of the seven later planetary Olympic camia, magic number squares, there are two signs in the zodiac assigned, and one for each of the other two. If you draw a circle and divide it into twelve sections, and then connect those sections in a hatching pattern of parallel lines like Venetian blinds, you will find that five lines divide the circle across and then a sixth line partitions the final space into two. Therefore, when we Rosicrucians say Mars, in this sense we mean the Olympic Camia Dignitary over two signs of the Zodiac. In other words, we mean him as Ares, the god of war, governing over Aries and Scorpio in the ecliptic zodiac. It should also be noted that the planet Mars appears to our eyes to be the color red. This, it should be remembered, can be significant of the color blue and vice versa. Therefore, Mars, though the god of war, can also be associated with the rose, which in turn represents the grand cross alignment of Mars with the other Olympic dignitaries in the heavenly spheres. Remember that Mars's opposite is Venus, just as the opposite color on the spectrum from red is blue, and vice versa. The sixth and seventh titles are Aries and Scorpio. Aries, the goat constellation, is traditionally thought of as being a spring sign. This is false. The so-called sun sign of astrology is backdated to how the sky was shaped 2,000 years ago. In other words, we are told if we were born on such and such a date, then we were born under such and such a sign. However, this sign that they tell us, the sun sign they call it, is not accurate to the actual way the stars were oriented around the planet at the date when you were actually born. The entire sun sign positioning is based on a fixed date approximately 2,000 years before the year 2000. Now, since Pope Gregory adjusted the calendar by 16 days from the Roman solar calendar developed by Ptolemy, adopted by Julius Caesar, then it could always be argued that those 16 days comprise a brief holiday period that can be as easily pasted in as an arbitrary year zero as it was cut out by the Pope. So we can say that either 2,000 years before the year 2000, and we can say that in the year zero when we say that, although calendricists assure us it never actually occurred. Should the need arise, one could always posit the year zero as being comprised of, at least, the 16 days edited out of the Gregorian calendar. There are, of course, countless other holidays that become forgotten or lost in the sands of time. There have been shifts in the calendars of as many different people as there have been calendars. For as long as people have been keeping calendars, there have been different times at which one of them needed to be brought up to date with and made to correspond with another one, 
and so for the two from that point on to be combined into the form of a single more or less unified calendar. We see this in the case of the Mayans who followed the Olmecs combining the most likely Nazcan lunar tonal model with the most probably Incan solar hab or vague year and who were in their own turn conquered by the Aztec century or calendar round. We likewise see this as the case in Egypt where the immigrant Hyksos from Babylon installed the solar civic calendar of 36 10-day weeks. So too did the Julian solar overtake and absorb the Ptolemaic hieratic era version of the Egyptian civic calendar as had the civic solar calendar of Egypt replace the Sothic lunar calendar, so did the Gregorian revision replace the Julian. These should not be thought of as replacing one another, though, only as modernizing and updating the prior popular mechanisms for measuring the temporal increments of daily business. If one system has lagged too far behind, such as the Sothic year that was based on the Hillelical rising of Sirius to begin the sowing season in pre-dynastic Egypt. Then it is merged, along with its culture, into the closest, more accurate calendrical system. This is how the synthesis of cultures occurs. It is for this reason we describe the synthesis of cultures using the symbol of the pyramid, and the number three. So we have the three great pyramids of Giza, side by side with three queen pyramids. These stand as a stone testimony to the monumental edifices capable of being erected in the name of this knowledge, that is, the knowledge of the pyramids and the number three. Know that the four-sided pyramids of architecture are but a symbol for the four-sided tetrahedron. Both an architectural pyramid and a tetrahedron have the same number of triangular sides. Therefore, they are symbolically interchangeable. So, if each architectural pyramid is a symbol of a tetrahedron, then the significance of there being three pyramids, comprised of twelve triangles in total, is obviously in reference to the zodiac. Thus we see that the archetypal pyramid is a symbol of a civilization already established, and we see that the meaning of the three pyramids is that of an intersection point of meeting between two or multiple established civilizations. These overlap one another's populations, biding their time until it is time for a calendar to decide between them. Under the Kamiya dignitary Mars, ruler of war, in the sign of fire, that is, by the measurements of the tetrahedron, and representing a sum of three, comes Aries, the ram's horn sign of the zodiac. Aries is a fire sign, meaning that, for now, it occurs in spring. The first fourth of the year, beginning with Aries, is all fire signs. Aries is a movable or changing sign in spring. This means that, as the twelve permutation sets of the four elements revolve around one another as the seasons corresponding to certain signs of the zodiac, so too then does the sign for that season in any given era correspond to a planetary ruler. As I have said, Aries is commonly attributed as ruling over the earliest month of spring. However, this is not accurate to the place this constellation actually occupies in the sky on those dates. The place that astrologers use to construct birth charts to mark the sign of the month in which you were born is called the sun sign, and it is a distinctly different concept than the rising sign that is actually rising above the horizon at the exact time you were born. The sun sign is fixed to when the rising signs all were at the time of Christ. For example, we say that Aries is the sun sign of the first month of spring. 
This does not mean that Aries is rising in the first month of spring anymore. The rising sign differs from the sun sign now by one full month. Now Aries rises in the second month of spring. Therefore, if you are born in the second month of spring, you would have Aries as your rising sign. And if you are born in the first month of spring, you will have Aries as your sun sign. Therefore, Scorpio, being a water sign of later fall, actually permutes out to be an air sign of early winter. This is how we measure the precession of the seasons. It is also interesting to note that Aries, by shifting from the starting month of spring to the middle month of spring, has, by now, assumed dominance over the date on which the planet Earth is at perihelion to the Sun, meaning it is located on the position of its elliptical orbit closest to the Sun. This date we celebrate as Easter, and its esoteric name is the Spring Equinox. For Aries to have switched places into this position means that, from the point of view of the fixed date of spring perihelion, or equinox, a new era or aeon has begun, the era or aeon of Aries, where Aries is the rising sign during the spring equinox. This occurs for the opposite perihelion point on Earth's solar orbit, the middle sign of fall, as well as the longest days and nights experienced at the aphelion points in Earth's orbit, those being the ones furthest away from the sun, that is, the summer and winter solstices. Therefore, when we Rosicrucians refer to the dawning of the spring equinox era of Aries, we mean the same thing as those who refer to the dawning of the winter solstice era of Aquarius. The only difference is that they are celebrating the false dawn of the sun sign of Aquarius, changing to the solstice dates of winter, while we are referring to the true dawn of the rising sign of Aries, changing to the spring equinox date. So, in other words, the age of Aquarius is our exoteric way of saying age of Aries in esoteric wisdom. All this may seem confusing at first, but it will become clear over time. Remember that for the rising sign, the era to follow the one we are in now will be winter equinox Scorpio. There is much more here that can be said about the changing of the eons. We have plenty of time to learn of this phenomenon and about its effects on nature. Also, I am available for questions. The eighth title is Neshima. Neshima is an old Hebrew word that denoted to the minds of the Jews up until the Babylonian captivity the same idea that the English word spirit denotes to us now. The Neshima could be the individual spirit expressed as one's charisma or the spirit of a town or place that similarly expressed its general character. The spirit of a place was usually represented by one of its indigenous fauna of animals, and the spirit of a town was usually expressed as an idol of the spirit animal placed on the hearth in the center of each citizen's home. Although they do not recognize it as such, many people still practice the worship of animal idols in the form of worship of indigenous species of fauna. To the Hebrews following the conversion of Abraham in the desert, when he was prepared to sacrifice his sons to his Elohim for blessing him with the tables of Ram, the records of history, the Neshima, as the spirit of the individual, has been considered sacred, while the spirit of the animal, the place, or the town has been considered profane. This differentiation of the interior spirit from the exterior spirits has caused an interesting and probably unforeseen difficulty in explaining that the spirit is all around us and within us both, 
and that although each of us has our own individual soul, there is only one spirit for the entire universe. We, as Rosicrucians, recognize the universal spirit as the idealized pattern of periodicity that occurs in between all the aperiodic patterns in our universe. This is what we call the spirit, or Neshima, pure geometry, encompassing all the dimensional expressions of shape and form. This is the G between the Masonic square and compass, where the square measures pattern in two dimensions, and the compass creates shape in the second dimension from the third dimension down. The G of Freemasonry is meant to allude to the higher dimensional geometry as more ideal, implied by the regular polygons in two dimensions and the five three-dimensional platonic solids as being ideal. Therefore, we associate the G of geometry with the spirit, or Neshima, of the universe. Geometry makes measurements on one dimension from the next dimension above. So, too, are all these dimensional geometries for our local universe combined and compared as only one unified field of study to the dimension of the Most High, which is a field of study higher even than the study of geometry, that is, the spirit of the universe. In the same way as the soul is said to exist after the body has died, and, in some cases, to have existed before a particular body was born, so we say then the soul is immortal. It was created and had a beginning, but it continues to exist without end. So we Rosicrucians say of the spirit, or Neshima, that it is eternal. It has always existed, without beginning, and it will always exist without end. Here we see that this is true for a measurement of universal law, even more so than for any given universal law itself. So we associate the spirit as eternal with the measurement governing patterns occurring over time. Therefore, we say that the pattern of our soul over time approaches the purest, most periodic interval possible. We call this purest interval possible the spirit, or the Neshima, and we call geometry itself the spirit, or Neshima, of the universe. Therefore, we say that for each different pattern there is an ideal, stable, or periodic state, we say, therefore, there are many different spirits, but that there are fewer spirits than there are patterns of motion in general. These spirits, or meta-patterns, are each more or less unique. However, the entire aggregate of all of them also averages out to a single meta-meta-pattern. This meta-meta-pattern, or universal spirit, does not appear from the outside to change over time. It contains all the motions of the universe, but its exterior surface is far beyond the local material universe. The meta-pattern of all forms is a spiral. The meta-meta-pattern of all spirals is a torus. Thus we say there is the eternal Neshima below and there is the eternal Neshima above, meaning there is the spiral spirit of each, and there is the Taurus spirit of all, but that both these forms, as pure geometrical patterns, surpass the limits of the material local universe. Therefore, we Rosicrucians call the Taurus the spirit above, and the spiral the spirit below. We call the spiral in the Taurus the spirit of man, and we call the representation of the spiral in the Taurus phi over pi, the spirit of the universe, or the body of God, 
the Kab Allah or the Kabbalah. Just as the spirit or Neshima of man is the spiral in the Taurus made manifest and real in the material universe, so too is the geometry of phi over pi, the body of God idealized as pure geometry in the higher dimensions beyond time. The spirit of man kneels before the body of God, and so too does the body of God rise up into a higher spirit to serve man, his most beloved creature. This concludes the knowledge lecture of the titles of five-degree regal Rosicrucian.